I like to think of myself as quite an open-minded, balanced, empathetic person in general, right? But when it comes to these books, that goes out the window, sorry. These are the eight books that I would accept no criticism of whatsoever. Like respectfully, I don't want to hear it. There are a lot of books that I really enjoy that I understand why other people don't. And that's okay, that's fine. But with these books, with these eight books, that's actually not fine. These are eight books that I consider to be perfect, beyond perfect. Six out of five stars. I would invent a whole new star just to give it to these eight books, okay? So we're gonna talk about them because I think you also need the divine experience of reading these incredible works of literature. So, firstly, Funny Boy by Shyam Salvadori. This book just immaculately intertwines the identity politics of the private sphere with the national politics of the public sphere. And it totally complicates that binary, that dichotomy of what the public and the private is, what that even means. In this book, the personal is political. And it's about one boy's early exploration of queerness in a very heteronormative school environment and family dynamic. But also, it is set against the backdrop of the Sri Lankan civil war. And so in a book where space is also incredibly political, liminal space becomes a really interesting arena for exploration. And so we have this boy who is existing at the fringes of society in that space where fire becomes smoke. And so a lot of his formative experiences exist in liminal space, like a garage, like these environments where you have a temporary refuge, but you know, and it's complicated by the inevitability of the fact that you have to cross back over into the public domain. They are not permanent, there's a transience to that space. And that is so fascinating to read about. I just think this book is absolutely sensational. No notes, no edits, no amendments, none at all. Perfect. Another book where the personal is political is Home Fire by Kamala Shamsi, which I think presents one of the most nuanced and detailed character studies I've ever read in modern fiction. I think this is going to be a modern classic of our time because we have this politician who is originally from a Muslim family and he finds his way to the top of the conservative party by being incredibly xenophobic towards the community that he is originally from. He introduces and enacts these scapegoating policies, he uses intimidation and scare tactics, perpetuating harmful, offensive and incorrect stereotypes in order to gain power and win the trust and the support and the votes of the white majority in Britain. However, his son falls in love with a Muslim girl and so we explore that whole dynamic and how they navigate that whole situation. And then we also follow the girl's family. Now her father was previously radicalized and now it's looking like her brother is feeling disaffected by the very policies that this politician is introducing. It is such a brave and bold and powerful book. It ripped my heart out. It's not afraid to ask difficult questions, to breach difficult topics. And I just think it pushes the boundaries or the perceived boundaries of the written word to its absolute limits and does so masterfully. But also at the same time, it feels effortless because the writing style is just so silky smooth. I think that Home Fire really encourages you to seek out the humanity in each individual character and get to know them on an intimate level, even if you don't agree with their values or their views or their attitudes, their approaches to life, and also their actions. And the book ultimately builds up to this huge crescendo, this intense climax, which gives me goosebumps even to think about. Naturally, I highly recommend this book and I will not shut up about it, sorry. The Prime of Miss Jean Brody is next. This is a book about Calvinism and the concept of predestination. Stay with me here. This is essentially the idea that people's destinies in life have been predetermined by God, and this is something that we can't change. And in this book, we have the character Miss Jean Brodie, who is a teacher, and she essentially replaces God with herself, and she creates this personality cult. The cult, in this case, being her students. It's a class of girls, and they're referred to as the Brodie set. As children, they absolutely worship her, and she assigns each of them a destiny of what she thinks they will do with their lives, what the outcome of their lives will be. And this acts as a kind of microcosm of society 
in a Calvinist belief system. It's set amidst the context of the Scottish Reformation and it takes place in Edinburgh. If you love the city of Edinburgh, you will adore this book because we're really taken on a tour of the city. I think it is absurdly clever and theological and it also facilitates and introduces a really fascinating conversation between generations in which each generation essentially learns from the mistakes of the past one and is in constant conversation with the generation that came before them. But as well as all that, there's also a huge theme of betrayal and it just explodes off the page. I love this book and it's also quite a quick read. Speaking of betrayal, we have Sula. It was not a case of whether Toni Morrison would be in this list, but just which one of her books would be in this list. But I think it's Sula for me. And Toni Morrison just understood the human condition like no one else. Sula is this story of female friendship and family and one of the most immersive and believable settings you will ever experience. Like the first few pages describe the bottom, which is this area, ironically, on a hill, where as a result of segregation, all of the black people of the town live in this area. It's fast paced from beginning to end. This cast of characters are phenomenal. Multiple characters are set on fire. <laughs> and if that doesn't convince you, I don't know what will. There's twists and turns. It's about humanity and inhumanity. It's about love and loss. It's about the connections we make and those that we sever and what the effect of each of those two things are, like the butterfly effect of our actions within a community. It made me cry multiple times whilst reading it. And it's just a masterclass in writing believable characters who are described so thoroughly and crafted so intricately that they could be standing right in front of you. And honestly, the fact that I got to exist on this earth at the same time as Toni Morrison, even just for a little bit, is an honor and a privilege. And that sounds extreme, but it's so true. Honestly, wow, Sula is just one of the best books of all time, I think. Before I jump into the next book, I just wanted to let you know that today's video is very kindly brought to you by Squarespace. Another thing I cannot find any faults with because Squarespace is the go-to platform for building a website or an online brand. You can create your own perfect website by customizing their amazing range of templates. For me, this was music to my ears because I have no coding experience. I would not know how to build a website from scratch, but Squarespace gives you the perfect launch pad. It gives you all of the resources that you need to create the best website you possibly can. And of course, your website is often the first surface of your business that people will ever interact with. And so it's important to make sure it shows the best and most authentic version of you. There's a blogging feature, there's also great analytical tools so you can work out what you should be making more of. And the best news is you can actually try it out completely for free at squarespace.com. You can use a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch a website that is beyond criticism, that is above criticism, <laughs> like these books I'm talking about, you can use the code jackedwards at squarespace.com slash jackedwards to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You're welcome. Next, we have Homegoing, which is a novel by a Ghanaian author called Yajiasi. And it's told through what is essentially this rich tapestry of short stories, but they're all interconnected because they're all about the same family. So like kind of through the generations of this family as they initially diverge and then at later points intersect and collide and cross over. And it is just so expertly done. This book covers so much ground, both geographically in terms of the spaces these people pass through, but also intellectually, like it was running rings around me. Again, each character is crafted with this meticulous detail. And you might be able to tell that I love character driven books. Like for me, no plot, just vibes is fine. As long as we have amazing characters who I feel like I know. And I also love books that make you feel like you get to experience the culture and the time of the places you're reading about. You know, history textbooks can tell you that millions of people were affected by this or hundreds of thousands of people experienced this one thing. But the beauty of fiction and the beauty of stories like this is that we get to walk a chapter in a character's shoes and understand what the smells in their house were like at the time, you know, what they were cooking, what they were eating, who they lived with, all the different people in that setting and how these things affected each one of them individually. So there is so much detail here. The pacing is absolutely perfect. This book is so ambitious, but done 
so well. Now, of course, The Handmaid's Tale was going to be on this list. I think it's the book that I've read more times than anything else, because on every rereading, I just discover more and more layers to Margaret Atwood's writing. So much symbolism, every single thing is there for a reason, every outfit, every colour that is referenced, every name that a person or a location has, like, everything has been so thoroughly thought through. And you know, I've actually never watched the TV show of The Hammond's Tale because, I don't know, I saw that they had given a name to the main character or said what we all kind of assumed her name was, but to me, that's such an important part of the book that we don't ever learn her name for real. We never have full confirmation of it. To me, the fact that she always withholds her real name is so important in a world where names are a commodity, where ownership over names and people is really, really important and has a large amount of value. So the fact that she withheld that even from the reader, I thought was so important. So the fact that the show didn't do that just made me a bit angry and so I, I've never watched it. Um, but I'm happy just like rereading the book over and over. That's fine by me. The Hammer's Tale is a dystopian novel in which women are used as vessels for carrying children. So they are the property of the men who impregnate them. And so if their commander, their master is called Glenn, then they will be off Glenn. If their master is called Fred, they will be off Fred. If their so it was called Jack, they would be off Jack. Like that's how it works here. And so that's why names are such a crucial like motif in this book. They're also all dressed the same. There's meant to be this kind of like homogenous ideal of a woman, but personal identity is becomes a commodity. And clinging on to who you really are as a person becomes a sign of protest, a revolution. And what I think is brilliant about this book is that every fragment of the dystopia, of this world, of this universe that Margaret Atwood builds up is from our real world. It's from things that have actually happened on Earth, things that real humans have done to other real humans. And so Margaret Atwood calls this speculative fiction. You know, the scariest part about this is that real people are capable of all of the things that are mentioned in this book. And that makes it all the more terrifying. Also, there's an ambiguous ending, which I just love. I love when it's kind of open to a myriad interpretations of what the ending means. And I think that means that each person's individual experience of the book is different, which is really, really cool. And this is the book I think about constantly. So, um, <laughs> next one. Small Things Like These, I think, is the most recent addition to the list of books that I consider perfect, the list of books I think are above criticism. And I think my appreciation for this is only going to exponentially grow over time because I, the longer I go from reading this book, the more I keep thinking about it. Unlike most of the others on this list, this is a really subtle, quiet, understated kind of book. It's set in Ireland around Christmas time. We follow one man and the book is cozy and charming, but the sheer ordinariness and the mundanity of this book is what makes the ending of the book and the development of this book so much harder hitting. Without spoilers, our peace is disrupted by the stark realization or reality check that actually a lot of people at this time were really suffering, uh, specifically at the hands of organized religion. And so we look at the treatment of fallen women by the church. But I think the build up to this moment is just absolutely flawless. It's delicate towards the victims, but also a brutal indictment of the perpetrators, kind of all at the same time, and I think that is a real talent. I will read anything that Claire Keegan writes, and I'm so happy that I discovered this perfect little book. And finally, we have Open Water by Caleb Azuma Nelson. This book is a meditation on the experience of the black body in modern Britain, specifically the intersection between blackness and masculinity, and it focuses on two intertwined anxieties. One being the anxiety that our central protagonist has surrounding microaggressions and police brutality as a black British man, and then the other being the anxiety of entering into a new relationship and giving yourself over so thoroughly to another person and all of the vulnerability that is involved in that action, that the act of falling for someone. Like, we're emphasizing the fall. And that feeling that you don't know whether that fall is going to be cushioned when you land. It's about how equally vulnerable and exciting that moment is. You know, that potential is electric. And the book too, the prose of this book is electric. It is so lyrical and poetic. 
but also really tender. And also if you love music, this entire book is just soundtracked by musical references, which I think is heightened by the fact that the prose itself has this rhythm, this like melody. It really breathes life into the narrative and it's just so wonderful. And the fact that this is a debut novel is actually offensive. Like that is outrageous and absurd that this is a debut piece of fiction because it is just so good and so self-assured and just utterly gorgeous. So. I don't know how you could criticize this book. I, if you have criticisms, they're not valid, I'm sorry. <laughs> and this is the only time you'll ever hear me saying this. Just specifically these books, I, I don't wanna hear it. And so obviously I think it goes without saying that I highly recommend reading all eight of these books. I think they're absolutely wonderful. And some of my favorite books of all time, I just don't even see how you could hate these books. I don't, I don't understand it. If you don't like these books, respectfully, I don't know what's wrong with you. <laughs> Like, I, I can't help you. Obviously take this with a pinch of salt, but these are the books that I absolutely adore and I hope that you do too if you do go and pick one of them up. Thank you so, so, so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. I am actually currently at Hay Festival in Wales. It's a book festival. I'm interviewing loads of really cool authors and celebrities. So head over to my Instagram, my TikTok, my social media to check out all the behind the scenes from this festival. It's an absolute dream come true. Um, and I'm so excited to be here. But yeah, thank you for watching. All the best, stay in touch, have a wonderful day. Thank you for making all of this possible for me. I appreciate you so much and bye-bye.